a good question. All right, let's move along. Um, as part of our responsibility to Ulster County, to our home here, and environmental issues, uh, I'd like to introduce Diane Dintroff. Uh, Diane is an re IBM retiree, although you don't look old enough to be retired. <laughs> Thank you. So You're much. welcome. <laughs> I coached him on that. <laughs> yeah, it took a lot of sessions to do. Um, you can use the microphone. Um, oh, use that one. I know, I know, I know it works. Uh, she's going to give you a presentation on something that's happening right here in our own backyard uh, about the Eusophis and the river and plants and some goblins and take it away. Uh, they're going to switch it over to you right now. Just give me, give us one second. There you go. We're we're getting there. Got it. Got it. You can start talking, and we'll catch up. When I first came to the region in 1980, no. to IBM, where's the presentation? I absolutely, no, I'll absolutely get it. fell in love with the Hudson River Valley, and I was fortunate enough to get a little house right above the Port Hugh and Freer Beach. I could see the lighthouse, the train station, the Grand Cliff Bridge in the background. But over the years, weeds started taking over. They were an invasive species, the water chestnut. Oh, I'll get there, hang on. Just give me a few minutes here. Keep talking, let's see how you have while you do right. the dance. I, <laughs> I did well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now last year was a really exciting year for the town of Esophis because it was our bicentennial. And as part of the bicentennial, we wanted to let people know how wonderful our waterfronts were and to come and enjoy our town. Um, I have some brochures on the back that you can pick up if you become more interested when you see some he of the sites that you can see uh, from our waterfront beaches. But these water chestnuts developed. This is our problem, this little guy right here. This is a bull's head, a water chestnut seed, a fruit, a nut. And Chet, who's a member of our water chestnut harvesting crew, will show you what these are. He can just he take one, throw them on, whatever, it's, it's, it's the display. when you're done. <laughs> there you go. And you'll, you don't want to step on these when you go to our beaches because they're very, very hard. And they're not the water chestnuts and Chinese food. All right, Diane, you're up. We can make flour from them. We're good. You're okay. good. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, that made an equation for successful harvesting of these and creating um, a recreational asset from this species, which was a problem to us previously. So by the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll understand what Chester could do, why it was important, and why it's important that we combat these bullheads. I want you to understand some of the support, the wonderful support that we've had from our town boards and from environmental groups in the community. The fact that we developed an elaborate plan, both for training volunteers within the town and for putting together reports on future harvesting and future work to be done in the town of Esopus. We not only solved the problem that we had in the Fair Beach area, but I submitted a slideshow and it won a f an international competition, $4,500 for a waterfront challenge contest for best improvement in the Northeast US. 
and we also won the Pride of Ulster County Award last week. So this is some of the organization behind it. Esopis is run by town boards. Our town supervisor is the financial officer, CEO. The, any of the boards, including the waterfront board, can set up committees. During our bicentennial, the committee, bicentennial committee was set up and I became involved because I am the webmaster of the Yahoo group Kingston Paddle Pals. And I was asked to do things which would show the tourist attraction of our waterfront parks. And the water chestnut harvesting project developed both from the town board and the waterfront board. And I rearranged these, but because of technical difficulties, we didn't change the slides this morning. Now, there is really more than just the support from the town boards. There are incredible environmental groups in the community that I've been networking with. that have really been talking about problems, you know, the problems of global warming, the problems of water purity. And because of contact with these groups, you really became aware that people need to learn not only about the fun things, the recreation, um, in it, but also what the dangers are and what they can do as volunteers and community members to help solve some of these problems. So the plan that we develop, both for the water chestnut harvesting crew and as an informational slideshow, talked about how water quality was affected, quality of life of our residents, and hopefully will influence tourism and economy. Businesses groups in our community supported our bicentennial. We had Kenko, who published the kayaking brochure for the bicentennial, and Van Loans, who provided water. The library, um, the slide presentation on the historic Round Out Creek. The Maritime Museum, as part of the Follow the River lecture series. We'll see uh, more of the slides that I had for the uh, Waterfront Challenge submission. And again, so our plan for the Water Chestnut Harvesting Group was to improve water quality. You're going to see in some of these slides how these water chestnuts choke off all the natural ve vegetation. They use up the oxygen so fish can't be under the water, invertebrates, the turtles, and some of the birds eat can't survive there, but there's a way to get around this by creating borders in these water chestnuts or channels that mitigate the, the nitrogen that comes down from fertilizer and pesticides and other pollutants um, by making these channels in the water. And an important part of the harvesting program was to do it in a much more cost-effective way than other areas. Several of our neighboring states, states spend half a million dollars or so a year um, fighting the water chestnuts. Now I'm going to give you a quick tour of some of the wonderful waterfront assets in Esopus. We're not just the town on the south of the round out that no one, has to, no one can spell. From, a, from the Freer Beach, you can see the Rhinecliff Lighthouse. But as you can see here, these water chestnuts have extended way out. This beach was entirely clear when I moved here. There was a swimming area. Miles Gordon held his sailing school and did man overboard exercises uh, west of the Rhinecliff Lighthouse totally impossible to do now. I used to launch my rowing shells, sailboat, sailboards, kayaks. You can't get through this. Another one of Esopus's parks is Slightsburg, which is on the Roundout Creek. Again, you have to get channels to get through at high tide through the islands going into the Roundout from Esopus. This is the Esopus Meadows Lighthouse. You can see that little building there is the Esopus Meadows Lighthouse and a freighter going by. Again, here are these weeds. 
This is the environmental center at Esopus Meadows. Esopus Meadows also has a water trail site for people in small boats like kayaks coming down the river for staying overnight. The turtles eat protein sources in the water. This is early in the spring when they're sunning themselves and before the water chestnuts have really taken over. Esopus Meadows is called a meadow because this is green all the way out to the lighthouse. This gives you a picture, this is back at Freer Beach, how thick these things are. And one of the reasons they're so thick, I need to flash ahead a couple slides here. Oh, where is it? Okay. Um, is that these things have flotation bulbs underneath them, which enable them to float on the surface of the water so that everything below them is choked off. Now, it's more than the 17 miles of Esopus waterfront that's affected by this. Here we were trying to launch from Wappinger's Creek. Again, a, a sea of water chestnuts. And it's even more than just the Hudson Valley. It's all the northeastern and mid-Atlantic states. And you have to ask, why has this problem gotten so bad so fast? And it's because these things multiply like worse than bunnies. It is estimate, and they last for 12 years, those hard little seeds. One acre of water chestnuts potentially produces enough of those seeds to cover 100 acres the following year. And then to make matters worse, they spread by several different ways. I can't count the number of times I've seen kayakers pull up water chestnuts and drop them in, thinking they're helping the problem, but they're actually spreading it by cuttings. Now this is how many, many areas still harvest water chestnuts, and how we did it for a couple years when we were having problems with our own old water chestnut harvester. Given the previous stats, you can see this is not very, not going to even put a dent in the problem. Then Chester came along. I'm going to go back one. Then this woman right here, Marion Zimmer, wrote a Hudson River Estuary Grant and got funding for Chester, our water chestnut harvester. 10,000 pounds of water chestnuts can be cut in 30 minutes. Big improvement. But this is a big, big machine, and people had to be trained to use it. We developed the cutting plan showing where we wanted channels in order to improve the water quality. We developed a plan on how to get out to the Hudson River from Freer Beach. The efforts in 2011 focused on the northern section of the Esopus waterfront. We had the plan, we had a video, we had our town supervisor doing ground training. And then here I am, very macho, running the big rig, being trained by our volunteer supervisor, Carol Carson, and her husband, Jim. And here was the result at Freer Beach. There was a big wide stretch here giving access to the river and these wonderful channels. Now these channels made it possible so that we ran a kayak scavenger hunt during the Great Hudson River paddle. When we did a lighthouse tour, kayakers often want to see the two lighthouses. You know, we paddled around in there. They offer a break in rough waters and wind from the Hudson River for smaller boats. Oops, wrong way. We saw an increase. Our swans hadn't been here for a few years. They came back. The water in these channels became so clear that I actually saw fish in the channels. 
You, I can rarely, I've rarely seen fish in the Hudson because of the water quality. We had a pair of osprey move into the area and also increase bald eagle activity because the fish could now survive in front of the beach area. And at the end of the session, we did like brainstorming what do we want to do after this point. And here we are back at the Environmental Center in Esopus Meadows, which is the southern end of Esopus, which we hope to do more work on next season so that people can get to the water trail, uh, so that they can get into Black Creek and the other recreational areas. And again, part of the reason I did this is we always need volunteers for our harvester. And I have a sign-up sheet back there if you know of anyone who's interested. Um, at any time, I'm willing to give a presentation on this. Um, the usual presentation is more uh, tourism focused than the initial organizational diagram charts. And then I also have one on the historic Round Up Creek and I'm working one for festivals along the Hudson. And if you want to get into kayaking, the, or my paddle pet group is essentially a site that I set up to make social networking easier for kayakers in the Mid-Hudson Valley. Good job. And that's it. Good job. Okay. Well, to yeah, you, you like Very that one, huh? <laughs> Yes. Go ahead. We got it through a grant from the Hudson River Estuary Program. The Bruderhof matched the funds for the program, and we traded in. We got some money from the old harvester that broke down. So we own it. You own. Okay. Yes. So uh, is there a possibility? They did talk about that last year, and um, you take that up with John Coulthard, our town the supervisor. I think there's I, there is a possibility, but the second, that's the second not mine. question um, I have is: uh, Is there any way to use the water chestnuts floor, not the, uh, the the leaves or something, in compost or use it in another way? Um, it must be very hard to get rid of if if you can't recycle it or something. I certainly would. Think that you might. I'm not an expert on this, but these things, when you bring them to the land, they start to rot very, very quickly, and they're very smelly and nasty, so they're hauled away. So I would expect them to be useful as a fertilizer, but I guess it hasn't been done yet. And again, you have the little nuts. Uh, yes, Jeff. They did try that, and it proved to be totally useless as soil composting or They did try that. Huh. They say you can make a flower out of it, but if you handle those nuts, they're very hard to get into and not really all that big. Are the nuts separated during the process from Let me go out here. You can only harvest these before the nuts are born. We have to stop harvesting once they're born because we, there's too much of a risk of spreading them. Got a question here. How yeah. far inland and how much of the uh, coast is invaded with these water chestnuts. Yeah, it's another um, one here. It is all over the place in the northeastern and mid-Atlantic states. And for example, like, like Chattakee, where our blue heron rookery is, um, it's starting to get spread into there, possibly carried on boats and fishermen's water buckets or even attached to feathers or fur in uh, animal fur. It's, it's very hard to stop, and it's anywhere where there is water, it can get. But your gadget destroy this pod? It, the pot isn't formed at the time that we cut it. We, we cut it so that they aren't produced. We stop the reproduction of those pods. But since they last for 12 years, they're in muck. They survive on land, water, in muck, 
What support have you gotten from New York State uh, EPA or DEC? I don't personally know the answer for that. You know, I imagine the Hudson River Estuary Program is part of that. Be something to, to look into, I would imagine. I mean, there are areas around the country where we've been invaded by certain species of, uh, of fish and other plant life, uh, which seems to be a growing concern uh, to both state and federal agencies. And I think this might be an issue that you might want to address. I would hope so. I would hope so, too. <laughs> Do you know where they came from? Eastern Europe and Asia. They were brought Just like over all of to, us. Be, to be flowering um, vegetation and decorative uh, ornamentation in ponds. Great. Diane, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Thank, thank you. you.